Well, first of all, let me uh, thank Emeka for, uh, as a matter of fact, TED Global for putting this conference together. And this conference is going to rank as the most important in the beginning of the 21st century. I think African governments will put together a conference like this. I think the AU will put together a conference like this. Even before they do that, they will ask for foreign aid. I will also would like to pay um, homage and honor to the TED Fellows, June Arunga, James Chikowati, Andrew, and the other TED Fellows. I call them the Cheetah Generation. The Cheetah Generation is a new breed of Africans who prove no nonsense about corruption. They understand what accountability and democracy is. They're not going to wait for government to do things for them. That's the cheetah generation. And Africa's salvation rests on the backs of these cheetahs. In contrast, of course, we have the hippo generation. <laughs> the hippo generation are the ruling elites. They are stuck in their intellectual patch complaining about colonialism and imperialism, they wouldn't move one foot. You ask them to reform the economies, they're not going to reform it because they benefit from the rotten status quo. Now, there are a lot of Africans who are very angry, angry at the condition of Africa. Now, we're talking about a continent which is not poor, but it's rich in mineral resources, natural mineral resources. But the mineral wealth of Africa is not being utilized to lift its people out of poverty. That's what makes a lot of Africans very angry. And in a way, Africa is more than a tragedy in more ways than one. There's another enduring tragedy, and that tragedy is there are so many people, so many governments, so many organizations who want to help the people in Africa, they don't understand. Now, we're not saying don't help Africa. Helping Africa is noble. But helping Africa has been turned into a theater of the absurd. It's like the blind leading the clueless. There are certain things that we need to recognize. Africa's begging bowl leaks. Did you know that 40% of the wealth created in Africa is not here, invested here in Africa? It's taken out of Africa. That's what the World Bank says. Look at Africa's begging bowl. It leaks horribly. There are people who think that we should pour more money, more aid into this bowl which leaks. What are the leakages? Corruption alone costs Africa $148 billion a year. Yeah, put that aside. Capital flight out of Africa, $80 billion a year. Put that aside. Let's take food imports. Every year, Africa spends $20 billion to import food. Just add that up. All these leakages, that's far more than the 50 billion Tony Blair wants to raise for Africa. Now, back in the 1960s, Africa not only fed itself, it also exported food, not anymore. We know that something has gone fundamentally wrong. You know it, I know it. But let's not waste time, our time talking about these mistakes because we spent all day here. Let's move on and flip over. To the next chapter and that's what this conference is all about the next chapter the next chapter begins with first of all asking ourselves this fundamental question whom do we want to help in africa there's the people and then there's the government or leaders now the speaker before me the previous speaker before me, Idris Mohammed, indicated that we've had a
abysmal leadership in Africa. That characterization, in my view, is even more charitable. I belong to an internet discussion forum, an African internet discussion forum. And I asked them, I said, since 1960, we've had exactly 204 African heads of state since 1960. And I asked them to name me just 20 good leaders, just 20 good leaders. Maybe you, want, you may want to take this, you know, leadership challenge, you know, yourself. I asked them to name me just 20. Everybody mentioned Nelson Mandela, of course, Kwame Nkrumah, Nyerere, Kenyatta, somebody mentioned Idi Amin. <laughs> I let that pass. <laughs> Point is, they couldn't go beyond 15. Even if they had been able to name me 20, what does that tell you? 20 out of 204 means that the majority, the vast majority of the African uh, leaders fail their people. And if you look at them, the slave of the post-colonial leaders, an assortment of military, fufu heads, Swiss bank socialists, crocodile liberators, vampire elites, quack revolutionaries, Now, this leadership is a far cry from the traditional leaders that Africans have known for centuries. The second false premise that we make when we're trying to help Africa is that sometimes we think that there is something called a government in Africa that cares about its people, serves the interests of the people, and represents the people. There is one particular quote. A Lesotho chief once says that here in Lesotho we got two problems rats and the government. <laughs> what you and I understand as a government doesn't exist in many African countries. In fact, what, what, what we call our governments are vampire states. Vampires is because they suck the economic vitality. Of their government is a problem in Africa. A vampire state is a government which has been hijacked by a phalanx of bandits and crooks who use the instruments of state power to enrich themselves, their cronies and tribesmen, and exclude everybody else. The richest people in Africa are heads of state and ministers. And quite often, the chief bandit is the head of state himself. Where did they get their money? By creating wealth? No, by ripping it off the backs of their suffering people. That's not wealth creation. It's wealth redistribution. The third fundamental issue that we have to recognize is that if we want to help the African people, we must know where the African people are. Take any African economy. An African economy can be broken up into three sectors. There is the modern sector, there is the uh, informal sector, and the traditional sector. The modern sector is the abode of the elites, is the seat of government. In many African countries, the modern sector is lost, it's dysfunctional. It is a meretricious fandango of important systems which the elites themselves don't understand. That is the source of many of Africa's problems, where the struggles for political power emanate and then spill over onto the informal and the traditional sector claiming innocent lives. Now, the modern sector, of course, is where a lot of the development aid and resources went into. More than 80 percent of agriculture's development went into the modern sector. The other sectors, the informal and the uh, traditional sector, 
are where you find the majority of the African people. The real people in Africa, that's where you find them. Now, obviously, it makes common sense that if you want to help the people, you go where the people are. But that's not what we did. As a matter of fact, we neglected the more the informal and the traditional sectors. The traditional sectors where Africa produces is agriculture, which is one of the reasons why Africa can't feed itself. And that's where it must be import food. All right. You cannot develop Africa by ignoring the informal and the traditional sectors. And you can't develop the informal and the uh, traditional sectors without an operational understanding of how these two sectors work. These two sectors, let me describe to you, have their own indigenous institutions. First one is the political system. Traditionally, Africans hate governments. They hate tyranny. If you look into their traditional systems, Africans organize their states in two types. The first one belong to those ethnic societies who believe that the state was necessarily tyrannous. So they didn't want to have anything to do with any centralized authority. These societies are the Igbo, the Somali, the Gikuyus, for example. They have no chiefs. The other ethnic groups which did have chiefs made sure that they surrounded the chiefs with councils upon councils upon councils to prevent them from abusing their power. In the Ashanti Kingdom, for, it, for example, the chief cannot make any decision without the concurrence of the Council of Elders. Without the council, the chief can't pass any law. And if the chief doesn't govern according to the will of the people, he will be removed. If not, the people will abandon the chief, go somewhere else and set up, set up a new settlement. And even if you look in ancient African empires, they were all organized around one particular principle, the confederacy principle, which is characterized by a great deal of devolution of authority, decentralization of power. Now, this is what I have described to you. This is part of Africa's indigenous political heritage. Now, compare that to the modern systems. The ruling elites established upon Af on Africa is a total far cry. In the economic system, in traditional Africa, the means of production is privately owned. It's owned by extended families. You see, in the West, the basic economic and social unit is the individual. The American will say, I am because I am and I can damn well do anything I want anytime. The accent is on the I. In Africa, the Africans say, I am because we are. The we connotes community, the extended family system. The extended family system pulls its resources together. They own farms. They decide what to do, what to produce. They don't take any orders from their chiefs. They decide what to do. And when they produce their crops, they sell the surplus on marketplaces. When they make a profit, it is theirs to keep, not for the chief to sequestrate from them. So in a, in a nutshell, what we had in traditional Africa was a free market system. There were markets in Africa before the colonialists took food on the continent. Timbuktu was one great big market town. Kandu, Salaga, they were all there. Even if you go to West Africa, you notice that market activity in West Africa has always been dominated by women. So it's quite appropriate that this section is called a marketplace. The market is not alien to Africa. What Africans practiced was a different form of capitalism. But then after independence, all of a sudden markets Capitalism became, became a Western institution. And the leader said, Africans were ready for socialism. Nonsense. And even then, what kind of socialism did they practice? The socialism that they practiced was a peculiar form of Swiss bank socialism, which allowed the head of states and the ministers to rip and plant Africans that uh, deposit treasuries for deposit in Switzerland. That is not the kind of system Africans had known for centuries. What do we do now? Go back to Africa's indigenous institutions. And this is where we charge the tutors. 
to go into the informal sectors, the traditional sectors, that's where you find the African people. And I'd like to show you a quick little video about the informal sector, about the boat building that I myself trying to mobilize Africans in the diaspora to invest in. Could you please show that? <laughs> reality. And secondly, they are the smallest reality. 
Africa has 53 nations. We have civil wars only in six countries, which means that the media are covering only six countries. Africa has immense opportunities that never navigate through the web of despair and helplessness that the Western media largely presents to its audience. But the effect of that presentation is it, it appeals to sympathy. It appeals to pity. It appeals to something called charity. And as a consequence, the Western view of Africa's economic dilemma is framed wrongly. The, the wrong framing is a product of thinking that Africa is a place of despair. What should we do with it? We should give food to the hungry. We should deliver medicines to those who are ill. We should do, send peacekeeping troops to serve those who are facing a civil war. And in the process, Africa has been stripped of self-initiative. I want to say that it is important to recognize that Africa has fundamental weaknesses. But equally, it has opportunities and a lot of potential. We need to reframe the challenge that is facing Africa. From a challenge of despair, despair which is called poverty reduction, to a challenge of hope. We frame it as a challenge of hope, and that is wealth creation. The challenge facing all those who are interested in Africa is not a challenge of reducing poverty. It should be a challenge of creating wealth. Once we change those two things, if you say the Africans are poor and they need poverty reduction, you have the international cartel of good intentions moving onto the continent with what? Medicines for the poor, food relief for those who are hungry, and peacekeepers for those who are facing civil war. And in the process, none of these things is real productive because you are treating the symptoms, not the causes of Africa's uh, fundamental problems. Sending somebody to school and giving them medicines, ladies and gentlemen, does not create wealth for them. Wealth is a function of income, and income comes from you finding a profitable trading opportunity or a well-paying job. Now, once we begin to talk about wealth creation in Africa, our second challenge will be who are the wealth creating agents in any society? They are entrepreneurs. And Joseph Schumpeter told us they are always about 4% of the population. The 16% are imitators. So, but they also succeed at the job of entrepreneurship. So where should we putting, be putting the money? We need to put money where it can productively grow. Support private investment in Africa, both domestic and foreign. Support research institutions, because knowledge is an important part of wealth creation. But what is the international aid community doing to Africa today? They are throwing large sums of money for primary health, for primary education, for food relief. The entire continent has been turned into a place of despair in need of charity. Ladies and gentlemen, can any one of you tell me a neighbor, a friend, a relative that you know who grew well, who became rich by receiving charity, by holding the begging bowl and receiving alms? Does any one of you in the audience have that person? Does any one of you know a country that developed because of the generosity and the kindness of another? Well, since I'm not seeing the hand, it appears that what I'm stating is true. I can see Bono says he knows the country. Which country is that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but let me, tell you, let me tell you this. External actors can only present you an opportunity. The ability to utilize that opportunity and turn it into an advantage depends on your internal capacity. Africa has received many opportunities. Many of them we haven't benefited much. Why? Because we lack the internal institutional framework and policy framework that can make it possible for us to benefit from our external relations. I'll give you an example. Under the Cotonou Agreement, formerly, formerly known as the Nome Convention, African countries have been given an opportunity by Europe to export goods duty-free to the European Union market. My own country, Uganda, has a, a quota to export 50,000 metric tons of sugar to the European Union market. We haven't exported one kilogram yet. We import 50,000 uh, metric tons of sugar from Brazil and, and, uh, and Cuba. Secondly, 
under the beef protocol of that agreement, African countries that produce beef have quotas to export beef duty-free to the European Union market. None of those countries, including Africa's most successful nation, Botswana, has ever met its quota. So I want to argue today that the, the fundamental source of Africa's inability to engage the rest of the world in a more productive uh, relationship is because it has a poor institutional and policy framework. And all forms of intervention need to support the evolution of the kind of institutions that create wealth, the kind of institutions that increase productivity. How do we begin to do that and why is aid the bad instrument? Aid is the bad instrument, you know why? Because all governments across the world need money to survive. Money is needed for a simple thing like keeping law and order. You have to pay the army and the police special law and order. And because many of our governments uh, are quite dictatorial, they need really to have the army club by the opposition. The second thing you need to do is turn your political hangers on. Why should people support a government? Well, because it gives them good paying jobs. Or, in many African countries, unofficial opportunities to profit from corruption. The third is no government in the world, with the exception of a few like that of Idi Amin, can seek to depend entirely on force as an instrument of rule. Many countries in the legit, they need legitimacy. To get legitimacy, governments often need to deliver things like primary education, primary health, roads, build hospitals and clinics. If the government's fiscal survival depends on it having to raise money from its own people, such a government is driven by self-interest to govern in a more enlightened fashion. It will sit with those who create wealth, talk to them about the kind of policies and institutions that are necessary for them to expand their scale and scope of business so that it can collect more tax revenues from them. The problem with the African continent and the problem with the aid industry is that it has distorted the structure of incentives facing the governments in Africa. The productive margin in our government search for revenue does not lie in the domestic economy. It lies with international donors. Rather than sit with the Ugandan, <laughs> rather than sit with Ugandan entrepreneurs, Ghanaian businessmen, South African enterprising leaders, our governments find it more productive to talk to the IMF and the World Bank. I can tell you, even if you have 10 PhDs, you can never beat Bill Gates in understanding comp the computer industry. Why? Because the knowledge that is required for you to understand the incentives necessary to expand the business requires that you listen to the people, the private sector actors in that industry. Governments in Africa have therefore been given an opportunity by the international community to avoid building productive arrangements with their own citizens and therefore allowed to begin endless negotiations with the IMF and the World Bank and then it is IMF and the World Bank that tell them what their citizens need. In the process, we the African people have been sidelined from the policy making, policy orientation and policy uh, implementation process in our countries. We have limited input because he who pays the piper calls the tune. The IMF, the World Bank, and the cartel of good intentions in the world has taken over our rights as citizens. And therefore, what our governments are doing, because they depend on aid, is to listen to international creditors rather than their own citizens. But I want to put a caveat on my argument. And that caveat is that it is not true that aid is always destructive. Some aid may have built a hospital, treated a hungry village, or rather fed a hungry village. It may have built a road, and may, that road may have served a very good role. The mistake of the international aid industry is to pick these isolated incidents of success, generalize them, pour billions and trillions of dollars into them, and then spread them across the whole world, ignoring the specific and unique circumstances in a given village, the skills, the practices, the norms and habits that allowed that small idea project to succeed, like in Sauri village in Kenya, where Jeffrey Sachs is working, and therefore generalize this experience as the experience of everybody. Aid increases the resources available to governments. And that makes working in the government the most profitable thing you can have as a person in Africa seeking a career. 
by increasing the political attractiveness of the state, especially in our ethnically fragmented societies in Africa. Aid tends to accentuate ethnic tensions as every, every single ethnic group now begins struggling to enter the state in order to get access to the foreign aid pie. Ladies and gentlemen, the most enterprising people in Africa cannot find opportunities to trade and to work in the private sector because the institutional and policy environment is hostile to business. Governments are not changing it. Why? Because they don't need to talk to their own citizens. They talk to international donors. So the most enterprising Africans end up going to work for government. And that has increased the political tensions in our countries precisely because we depend on aid. I also want to say that it is important for us to note that over the last 50 years, Africa has been receiving increasing aid from the international community in form of technical assistance and financial aid and all other forms of aid. Between 1960 and 2003, our continent received $600 billion of aid. And we are still told that there is a lot of poverty in Africa. Where has all the aid gone? I want to use the example of my own country called Uganda and the kind of structure of incentives that aid has brought there. In the 2006-2007 budget, expected revenue 2.5 trillion shillings, expected foreign aid 1.9 trillion. Uganda's recurrent expenditure, by recurrent, what do I mean, hand at mouth, is 2.6 trillion. Why does the government of Uganda budget spend 110% of its own revenue. It's because there's somebody there called foreign aid who contributes for it. But this shows you that the government of Uganda is not committed to spending its own revenue to invest in productive investments, but rather it devotes this revenue to paying structure of public Thank expansion. You, public administration, which is largely patronage, takes 690 billion. Mm -hmm. The military, 380. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, which employs 18% of our poverty-stricken citizens, takes only 18 billion. Trade and industry takes 43 billion. And let me show you what does public expenditure, rather public administration expenditure in Uganda constitute. There you go. 70 cabinet ministers, 114 president. See the president, except on television. <laughs> and when they see him physically, uh -huh. it is at public functions like this. And even there, it is him who advises them. <laughs> we have 81 units of local government. Each local government is organized like the central government, a bureaucracy, a cabinet, a parliament, and so many jobs for uh -huh. the political hunger zone. They were 56, and when our president wanted to amend the constitution and remove term limits, he had to create 25 new districts now, they're 81. 333 members of parliament, you need Wembley Stadium to host our parliament, 134 commissions and semi-autonomous government bodies, and semi-autonomous government bodies, all of which have directors and cars. And, and the final thing, this is addressed to Mr. Bono in his work, he may help us on this. A recent government of Uganda study found that there are 3,000 four-wheel drive motor vehicles at the Ministry of Health headquarters. Uganda has 961 sub-counties, each of them with a dispensary, none of which has an ambulance. So the four-wheel drive vehicles at the headquarters drive the ministers, the permanent secretaries, the bureaucrats and the international aid bureaucrats who work in aid projects while the poor uh, die without ambulances and medicine. Mm -hmm. Finally, I want to say that before I came to speak here, I was told that the principle of TED Global is that a good speech should be like well, a mini well, skirt. Uh, uh, it should be short enough to, to arouse interest, but long enough to cover the subject. I hope I have achieved that. Thank you very much. Why, why, why is she doing that? Why is she looking at the Colonna?
Tum tum kuritum. We need our life, you know. We are starting now. Um, so, <clears throat> the patron and chancellor of the university is on his way, uh, together with the register of the university and some colleagues. Hey, we may be seated. I'm pleasantly surprised, Patron, to see this number of people uh, in this rain. <laughs> so, welcome everybody, and uh, welcome to the Patron and Chancellor of the University of South Africa. And we have the Registrar of the University, Professor uh, Demani here in front, uh, Michael Demani, and the uh, two colleagues uh, who are also teaching at 